Okay, onward. Great, let us go ahead and get started. So continuing our madcap run through the great philosophical and religious traditions of world history, we last week spent one hour, one session I should say, on Christianity. Today we will spend one session on Buddhism. As we've noted, we hope that the absurdity of what we're doing this semester will be outweighed by, we hope again, the tremendous excitement of wrestling with these complex ideas and hopefully doing so so absurdly quickly will add to that because it just allows us to juxtapose these radically different traditions with each other and hopefully inspire us to think in incredibly complex ways. So today we do indeed turn to Buddhism and to lay out an introduction of this, let us quickly return as we did last week to 3,000 years ago. As we mentioned last week, if you look at the world of what, as we mentioned, were called the Great Bronze Age civilizations of Eurasia, they were all, as we noted, extremely comparable. They all existed in a hierarchical social order in which your position in life was determined exclusively by birth. The religions of the day were part and parcel of this. It usually involved a priestly class that would make sacrifices to divinities on behalf of the kingly class, those born below those. The warriors would fight on behalf of the kings. Those born below the warriors were the workers that would do the things like help with the chariots, um, grow food, etc., on behalf of those upper classes. And as we also noted, when these great Bronze Age kingdoms, many of which lasted for two, three millennia, began breaking apart in the mid-first millennium BCE, you had these radical attempts to rethink the world. The focus of, well, the starting points, I should say, of much of our inquiries of this semester. Last week we noted these occur in, for example, Greece, where you get the figures that will later be called the Greek philosophers. I mean, it's an <laughs> indigenous term in Greece, but, but <coughs> the philosophers who are not philosophers in the way that we tend to use the term now, but attempts to radically rethink the world. So the pre-Socratics, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, etc. As we noted, on the eastern end of Eurasia, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Zhuang Tzu, Mencius, and of course in South Asia, the Buddha, the Upanishads, Jains, etc. We also noted, very briefly, but it was crucial for last week and will seem important for this week as well, once these first opening attempts occur in the mid-first millennium BCE, a lot of the ideas are then taken over by the subsequent empires and that in turn inspires yet another attempt to radically rethink these ideas, leading to the explosion of these salvationist religions. So last week we noted, this is when you get Christianity, a major salvationist religion emerging in the first century of the Common Era, building upon earlier Judaic ideas and of course earlier Greek philosophical ideas um, with a, a complicated legacy that we discussed at length last week and we will see those same issues will be playing out in our discussion today. So let us now turn to South Asia to see the variations that are occurring in South Asia in the Bronze Age, in this opening mid-first millennium BCE, rethinking of the world, and in the development of a later very significant millenarian movement. So first going back to the Bronze Age. All of these Bronze Age societies, as we noted, Based, were based upon a hierarchy, and they all had mechanisms to argue that that hierarchy was somehow inherently natural to the world or divinely sanctioned and therefore unchangeable. The variation of this that's occurring in South Asia will be important when we get to the later revolts against it. So in South Asia, all of that was true, but unlike other South, uh, Bronze Age religions, there was social mobility built in, but not within this lifetime. The view, on the contrary, held the following. Your station in life is indeed hierarchical, so you can be born a Brahmin, you can be born a king, you could be born a, a warrior, you could be born into one of the lower classes. However, that position was based upon what you had done in a previous life or previous lives in the plural. 
everything we do, according to this notion, creates karma, and that karma will affect your rebirth, which means that the current order in which we were born in that Bronze Age period was based upon what we had done before and therefore deserved. If we were born into one of the highest classes, we deserved to be there because of what we had done in previous lives. If we were born into one of the lower classes, we equally deserved to be there because of what we did badly in previous lives. However, the implication is also you could and should, obviously, work to improve yourself. And if you do, that same working of karma would allow a higher rebirth in the life to come. So. Unlike most Bronze Age religions, the workings of karma does create social mobility, not in this life, but over the course of lifetimes. Then, not surprisingly, based on what we have seen in the first millennium BCE, all of what I just mentioned begins to collapse as the Bronze Age kingdoms that supported these ideas began to collapse and attempts to radically rethink them arose. There have been several of these, you know, have in your readings, the Upanishads, Jainism arises at this time, something we won't be discussing in this class, unfortunately, for lack of time. And then the one that we'll be focusing a great deal of time on is Buddhism. So the Buddha emerges in 6th, 5th century BCE. So he's a rough contemporary of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Zhuang Tzu, etc. And when this occurs, and later we will see a salvationist religion rereading this, you will have the formation of a religion, Buddhism, that will have a formative influence on South Asia, Southeast Asia, and all of East Asia. So to begin our discussion of Buddhism, let me begin with a story of the Buddha himself. How that was often told, and we will get a little bit later to variations of the story, because the story, as we will see, is read and reinterpreted over and over again. But let me just begin with one of the most common stories. So it is 6th century BCE, and a son is born to a major king. That son is named Siddhartha Gautama. He is, of course, a prince, and he will be the future king. And the king wants his son to grow up in perfect happiness and contentment. And so, with the fabulous wealth that, of course, a king has access to, because he can, of course, exploit everyone in his realm, he decides he will create for his son the perfect world, where that son will never experience anything bad. And so, an entire wing of the palace is constructed for the sun. And servants are trained to serve him perfectly. And Siddhartha grows up in this wing of the palace. Every desire immediately fulfilled by this team of servants, always working on his behalf. And if one of those servants gets sick, immediately there's another servant to come in, so he would never even expect experience someone being sick. And since childhood lasts a while, the servants begin aging. So they would be replaced too. So the son would never even have to experience aging. I mean, he would feel himself aging, but it wouldn't be a bad thing because he's having every desire fulfilled. And meanwhile, he wouldn't see it around him. And everyone who walks into his quarters is always acting and nice and of course gleeful to serve him. So he has no sense that you know these are people being made to serve him. They're just there for him. And the entire world seems perfect. But at a certain point, Siddhartha, as he begins to get older into adolescence, it dawns in him that maybe something else is going on. Um, it dawns in him, you know, when he you know, demands his tea, that sure, the servant, oh, yes, yes, yes. But, but it's a little clear there's an undercurrent where, no, this servant isn't just happily serving him. And it begins to dawn in him there's something else going on. It may be, perhaps, that this entire world is being constructed for his false happiness. And so he decides he wants to leave the palace. And he wants to find out what's really going on. 
So the father says, no, 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 son, no. Why would you want to leave the palace? No. But the son is absolutely intent on leaving the palace. And so finally the king gives in, he claims to his son, but only when he first has his army go out and clear the area where Siddhartha will be taken from anyone who is aged or sick or poor, where any suffering, including the suffering that's being created to allow this palace to exist for his son, is taken away. And so Siddhartha is taken out on the glorious chariots, and he sees this glorious world of wonderfully happy people, none of them sick, aged, exploited, and everything seems wonderful. But Siddhartha, exactly as he was feeling in his palace, is noticing something isn't quite right. They're acting this way, but they're not really happy and content. And then he begins to notice a few people that the army hadn't quite gotten access to. There seem to be some sick people out there and some elderly people out there. And Siddhartha asks his father, what, Dad, I, what, what is going on? And father says, no, 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 look away, look away. It's nothing, it's nothing, look away. And Siddhartha, to some extent, looks away, but he knows at some level this is wrong. But he does look away. And then he returns to the palace, and he continues. He gets married. He has a child who will, of course, be the next king after he becomes king. But he reaches a point where he can look away no longer. And he realizes, yes, he is living in an illusory world created for his happiness, and he wants to find out what the world really is. And it dawns on him beyond this. To really find out what the world is, he doesn't need to go out with his armies <laughs> of, of his dad to experience the world because that's not really the experience. He wants to see what the world really is, and he wants to find out the truth. So, in this world of unbelievable wealth, unbelievable power, with unbelievable power awaiting him because he soon will be king, he leaves. He leaves his future, he leaves the palace, he leaves his family, he leaves everything. And walks away from the palace and decides to find the truth. He meets some spiritual practitioners who explain to him, yes, you have been living in an illusory world, and the key now is to break from this phenomenal world of, of your desires based upon your immediate bodily hopes and, and, and wishes, your desire for fame and glory and wealth and power. And what you need to practice is extreme forms of bodily mortification to break all that you were raised in. So he begins doing this practicing extreme forms of bodily deprivation, mortification, to try to break everything that he was raised with. But he realizes that's not helping him to really seek, or find, I should say, the truth. And also the spiritual figures keep saying, once you break down this body, what you'll be left with is this eternal soul that is one with the entire cosmos. But even that, he realizes, is failing. Because is there this one thing that's somehow perfectly connected to everything else if he gets rid of the body? And he realizes, no, no, no. This, too, is an inadequate teaching. So he continues to search. And he finally decides that he will sit under a tree. And he will sit there until he can understand and he sits, and he sits, and he thinks through his life. He thinks through and now finally begins to understand what had been going on through his youth, realizing that in fact his father had created for him this illusory world, and realizing of course that was simply a part and parcel of what we are all doing, all world where we can be happy and content and not see the suffering that we are creating for others by our attempts to be happy and content all the time. And as he realizes what, in fact, he has been, 
part of in his life, he also begins to recollect the previous lives. He realizes he is not on this planet for the first time. In fact, he has been having eons and eons of lives. And in those eons of lives, he has also been doing some equivalent of this. He wasn't a prince in those lives, but whatever station he was in, he was always trying to focus on his own personal happiness, trying actively not to see the suffering he was inflicting on everyone around him because of that attempt. And it comes clear to him that, in fact, the entire world he is living in consists of humans doing this so totally and so completely that we have in fact constructed this entire illusory world based upon each of us striving to become powerful and gain incredible wealth, becoming attached to everything that this wealth and power would allow us to gain, not realizing the intense suffering we are creating with everyone around us and becoming better and better at not even seeing them exactly as he had been doing throughout his entire youth. And then at a certain point, finally, Siddhartha achieves enlightenment. He achieves what is called nirvana. Nirvana means extinguishing. And in the extinguishing, he extinguishes everything that has been leading to this world of illusion. Not simply breaking from his dad, <laughs> but much more importantly, realizing he was a part and parcel of it. And not just realizing, I must reject my wealth and fame, etc., which he's already done anyway, but he needs to realize even this idea of the self that has in fact underlain everything he had been doing, even that was an illusion. And when he achieves nirvana, he, but now let's call him the Buddha, when he achieves nirvana, he achieves what in the early tradition is called nirvana with remainder. Meaning that he, Siddhartha, is still there, as a remainder of all of the karmic work that had been building up over the course of his life. But now that he has achieved nirvana, he no longer is living his life based upon this self and all of the desires of this self inflicting suffering on those around us. On the contrary, at that moment, he becomes flawlessly compassionate to all living creatures, immediately seeing the suffering that exists in the world, and now devoting himself out of pure compassion to help every living creature. He therefore stands up and begins his teachings. And those teachings are the following. Pieces of this we have seen, but now let's lay them out much more clearly. We, we meaning all living creatures, construct illusory worlds out of our desires. Among those are the obvious ones, our desires, again, for wealth, power, fame. Those are the obvious ones, although we still fall into them all the time, but those are the obvious ones. It turns out it's much more insidious because the worlds we construct out of these desires even include much of what we innocently and dangerously would think of as being us at our best. Us when we are flourishing and happy and things are going well, and yes, of course, being very successful and getting wealth and fame, but still, we're doing it because we are being you know, true to ourselves and being good human beings. All of this is still coming out of desire. Even our attempts to think, with my will, I will create a better self and a better world. Much of the work that we are doing when we say that is in fact, unbeknownst to us, although that's because we're just refusing to pay attention to what we're really doing, an attempt to build this illusory world for me. Exactly like his father was doing for him and that he was a part and parcel of allowing to happen. 
and most significantly of all of these, come down to this little thing that we keep at the center of all of our strivings, the self. When I think I am this coherent self who, again, even at my best, with my will, trying to create a better world, no. The coherent self is itself a construct, an illusory construct, but again, not in the way we tend to use the word illusion in, in English. Illus these illusory constructs become real things that define and construct entire worlds around us. When we do this, I think of myself as a coherent self, and I construct an entire world around that. Not only am I a coherent self, but everything around me I try to read as permanent and equally coherent. Again, the obvious ones, wealth and fame, all fleeting. But what about the less obvious ones? My relationships. But they're not really relationships because this person I think I'm in a relationship with, I co construct as an illusory being. I'm this coherent self. There's this coherent self that perfectly matches with me, which means I'm not really seeing this person I'm in a relationship with. I'm seeing this coherent self I've constructed basically out of my own desires for what I think is good for me. And build that up over the course of a lifetime. Our entire world, everything about our world, is, at least in potentia, but minus the work we'll be doing, probably think most of it, as being exactly this. A construct we have created for ourselves and by doing so, creating incredible suffering around, around us, not just immediately, but throughout the entire world without our seeing it. Or more importantly, we're Siddhartha out with his, the, his dad's army consciously trying not to see it. This is the world that we live in. It is a world of suffering, and it's a world of suffering that we have been part and parcel of creating. And if that sounds bleak, it is much bleaker, because the Buddha will also build upon these earlier notions of karma. You might think, OK, well, if it's all that horrible and, and, and I'm creating this world of suffering, at least you know, for the sake of all living creatures, you know, I will pass away at some point. So that will end the suffering. No, it does not. Because the suffering I am creating for others, again, it's illusory. But remember, it's illusory not in the sense that it's just it's nothing. These become real constructs that continue. And so all of this suffering I'm creating continues through karma in life after life after life. All that I am doing will affect others, not just right now, it will continue to have effects. And indeed, this entire world we've constructed will continue to have effects of more suffering for, minus the work we're about to talk about, potentially all of eternity. And this suffering is not just the big stuff we know we shouldn't do. We're creating suffering all the time by the seemingly minor things we are doing. And that will have an impact on the world for eons and eons and eons. This is the world we are creating. Now, if death is not a solution, what is? Well, we've already gotten a hint of it, but now let's elaborate what exactly this would entail. It would entail, ultimately, the kind of incredible work to break the suffering we're creating, which again is created by our desires. How do we do this? We begin the work of discipline, practices of meditation, all aimed at conquering these desires that are leading to all that I just mentioned. And when you do this, you are ultimately trying to break what will seem the ultimately impossible thing to break, but this is the goal, even this notion of a coherent self that you foolishly, dangerously think is there and is somehow this perfect thing that you should always be embracing. That 
is one of the ultimate and key things, you will be breaking down. Now, how do we do this in a larger sense? Um, I just mentioned we're doing the discipline, we're doing the meditation, but in a larger sense, how in this world is such a thing ultimately possible? Now, one model is, of course, the Buddha, but it is very important to note the Buddhist tradition takes out any easy way of thinking about this story. If, for example, I think, okay, well, I'll just go lock myself into a room and I will just won't interact with anyone and therefore I'll, I'll, I won't be creating suffering with those around me, that fails in two key ways. First and most obviously, no, you're Siddhartha back in his palace, right? I mean, I mean, if you are simply hiding away from the world, you are not helping anyone. You are not breaking suffering. And even the idea is, well, I'm not actively creating suffering. Of course you are. If you're sitting in your room, you're completely dependent upon an entire world of suffering that allows you to sit in your room and eat your nice prepared meals. I mean, this is, this is you're actively a part of this world of suffering. But there's a second key issue, too, that is equally important. So not only are you actively a part of this world of suffering, but by definition, you've missed the key part of it, which is why you're actively part of it, because it proves you haven't accomplished anything. Were you ever to break the self, what you would experience immediately is a world of t is a, a sense of total compassion for all living creatures. If you're locked in a room, you're not helping anyone. <laughs> anyone. That is not compassion. And by definition, that absolutely is not enlightenment. Let me give a stronger example. Suppose you decide, OK, well, then I'll at least follow one piece of what the Buddha did, so I will leave my family and join a monastery. If you right now, like right after class, decided to do that, I guarantee you the monk would sit you down and say, of course you're not ready to do this. I mean, you may be running away from your family, but that's probably for other reasons that have nothing to do with this. Uh, to truly do this, you take, it takes incredible levels of preparation. And by incredible, oftentimes this can mean lifetimes eons of lifetimes to reach the point where that even becomes a possibility that you would be spiritually prepared to do such a thing. And note immediately, if you think, okay, well, no, <laughs> maybe in my previous lives I've been doing it, so I'll join the monastery, and then, you know, <laughs> things will be fine, and I won't have to deal with all the, the misery of this world. No, first of all, it's going to be incredibly difficult. It's not easy doing the kind of training discipline we're talking about, to put it mildly, but then, don't think, and then I'll be liberated. No, if you're successful, which is a big if, what you will experience is compassion, which means you will not immediately therefore think, okay, then I'm going to achieve full nirvana and then I will be liberated. No, that would be selfish, which by definition means you have not achieved enlightenment, which means by definition you will never achieve nirvana. If you are really achieving this, you then will devote your life and lifetimes to come out of compassion to helping all living human beings. So lest you think this is giving you an easy out, as you know, if it's giving you all the suffering, but the easy out is just get, run away from the suffering. No, it builds in in the tension that that is precisely what you cannot do. That's the ultimate selfishness. That's it hard to back in his palace. You, if you are doing this properly, will devote your life to compassion passionately helping all of those around us. So, oh yes, please. That, that is a later iteration. Yes, where I'm going next, indeed, precisely. So, indeed, perfect point and, and perfect segue. So, I have indeed jumped a little bit, so let us now return to our chronology. So, these opening teachings of the Buddha, prior to the social sides that I was just mentioning, are laid out and the Buddhist movement begins. It is, however, early on, a relatively small movement, mainly focused around itinerant monks following the Buddhist teachings, acting on behalf of those of us in the world 
who are suffering, it then, following a general Eurasian pattern, becomes picked up by a major Iron Age empire, um, the Mauryan Empire, where Ashoka is converted to Buddhism. And in part out of that experience, you then start getting a rethinking of the tradition. Right at a key moment in Eurasian history more broadly, when in part because of these great Iron Age empires, huge trade routes begin spreading throughout Eurasia. And a new form of Buddhism begins emerging, initially in India, but then beginning to spread out along these trade routes, and ultimately moving into China, and from there moving to all of East Asia, and in a separate route, moving through Southeast Asia, and growing there. In the form that moves through Central Asia, China, and Japan and Korea, so the East Asian form of this, it will take the form of a new Salvationist religion, Mahayana Buddhism. And Mahayana Buddhism is a late, it's very much like Christianity in that sense, a Salvationist religion building upon the earlier teachings of the Buddha, but now radically rereading them. And to give you a sense of this rereading, let me quickly return to one of the many rereadings in this tradition of the story with which we began, the story of the Buddha himself. So in one rereading that will occur in the Mahayana tradition, actually the Buddha achieved enlightenment eons ago. And out of pure compassion, chooses to reincarnate in ways that can help us, to give us visions of the possibility of help. And therefore, his rebirth as Siddhartha was done precisely so we can see the life of a human being born into incredible wealth and incredible power, doing with wealth and power what we're all kind of de facto doing, but they're at an extreme level, and Hopefully through that story, we will be guided toward the work that is therefore crucial. And what would this mean socially? Indeed, getting back to the question or the, the comment, yes. What this will work into is a very distinctive understanding of how these entire ways of institutionalizing Buddhism should operate. So the form that will become prevalent, beginning in China, and then from there all of East Asia, is the following. You will form monasteries in which you will have monks and nuns who will leave society, exactly as in the Buddha narrative, to join the monastery and to undergo the incredible levels of discipline required to break the self, but again, the key is, this is not seen as an escape. If you're really doing it, what this means is you are gaining the compassion and, because of the discipline, the spiritual potency and power that will allow you to then re-engage with those of us in the world of suffering in ways that those of us in the world of suffering, number one, would never be able to see, but number two, to be able to engage it in ways that we could never imagine. To give you some concrete examples, if you are in these monasteries, you will refuse to bow down to secular power, so you literally will not bow down to an emperor or a king because you will not recognize that power. You recognize in this constructed world that person has power, but you are above that. And you will do what is necessary to break suffering. Not because in Buddhism there's some fee-given political ideology, some ism, you know, <laughs> how a state should be organized. Rather, as a compassionate being, you are seeing the suffering going on and you're being trained to act in ways to break that suffering. In ways that, again, would be beyond things we could even imagine doing to ourselves. Um, to give extreme examples, but they're telling ones setting yourself on fire. So self-immolation as a protest to things going on in the world. I mean, we couldn't even imagine such a thing. If you've been doing this level of discipline, you can. <laughs> and you do it precisely as an act of breaking what is, what is in front of you. 
to give a much more recent example, but a very telling one as well. So Gandhi, who is not just a Buddhist, but coming out of these traditions as well as many others that he's actively reworking, um, how does he protest the English Empire? His entire vision is you don't try to have a violent revolution against the British Empire, because then you're falling into exactly what the British fell into. The whole goal is incredible levels of discipline to allow the protesters to act in ways that will force the British to see the suffering they are creating in the world. To the point where, literally, to give one famous example, a protest will be given in which the protesters will have to walk unarmed to simply get the salt they need for their food, walking into British soldiers who will then beat them to the point of brain damage or death. And photographers are there taking pictures of this, meaning that the next day in all the London newspapers, everyone has to pick up these newspapers and see, OK, you can claim, your, you can rationalize your empire by saying, oh, we're giving enlightenment to the world. No, this is what your empire is. Look at what your empire really is. And Gandhi did this to such an extreme that he felt if at any point his own followers were, were doing this for any selfish purpose, I mean, not that example, but any aspect of this for selfish purposes, he would actually stop the protest and say, we need more discipline. We're not there yet. The whole point is you force those in positions of power to see the suffering they're creating as an act of compassion, because only if you do that will you really see suffering. If you're doing violent overthrows of the government, you'll just create more suffering. If your goal is a compassionate end of suffering, you will be willing to take extraordinary measures precisely to end that suffering. So hopefully, the British will see, no, the empire is itself inherently wrong. That is the goal. Now, seeing this arc of Buddhism, let us now pull back and make some larger points about what is going on in this tradition. To begin with the most obvious ones, but it's some of the most powerful ones, Note, the Buddhist tradition is about not simply rejecting most of the values we tend to hold dear, oftentimes implicitly, to the extent we don't even see them as values, like, of course, I, I have a will, and I have a self, and, and, and I should be striving to be successful in the world, and even hoping to create a better world through my will. Um, here you have a tradition that is going to be actively teaching you Every single part of the sentences I just uttered has an incredible and inherent danger, and we are being trained to see how, even when we think we are behaving well in the world, we are in fact inflicting suffering. And it ups the ante dramatically by saying, not just immediately, you know, we'll create a little bit of unhappiness by those who have to deal with us. No, you're creating suffering that will last eons and eons and eons radically upping the ante on the horrors that we are unknowingly inflicting in the world. And for the precisely the same reason, it cuts out all of the things we would tend to see as the way to improve the world by realizing, no, the danger is it, these are all part and parcel of the problem. And it equally cuts out an easy approach of saying, and therefore I'll just run away, because no, again, running away means you're Siddhartha in his palace walls, not or trying actively not to see what's really going on around him. It builds in, in other words, this incredible critique of the world around us, while also building in any kind of easy rejection, or <laughs> easy way of getting around that, saying the only thing you can do is begin seeing the horrible suffering you're inflicting on the world by your even most mundane and seemingly, you might think, good actions, training yourself to see that, training yourself to see the real suffering that underlies things that we think of as perfectly fine and normal in this world. You're training yourself to see that the world that we experience is not the real world, or rather it is a constructed world. You are training yourself also, as that training occurs, to gain more compassion about how to help in that suffering. And the extreme of this would be a world of total compassion, which, again, is something the tradition builds in to say, 
it's unlikely we would ever be able to achieve this even for eons and eons and eons of lifetimes. To take out easy, any field like, okay, <laughs> I'm doing fine now, I've, I've achieved it. But by definition, the traditions say, no, you by definition have absolutely not. It is an incredible tradition, which as we have noted, and this will be true for all of the traditions we'll be looking at, this is why we're choosing them, that forces a fundamental challenge to just about every assumption we tend to make of the world and forces a fundamental challenge to how we would even think about how to respond to the problems it's seeing. And that, of course, is part of its incredible power. So with that as an opening statement, let us now open this up for no, conversation. Yes. Sure, and there's much more to say, but, but, but yes, but we'll build the rest yeah. of it based upon the discussions that develop. So, Thoughts, concerns, questions, whether grand or very, very specific? Yes, please. Two thoughts. Yes. One, one just as a mother, I thought that it's no surprise that this field is defended by a father, because a mother would not think yes. that there is an option of being unseparated from some of their children. Yes. Yes, no, wonderful question. And the answer is across the board, no. I mean, and, and let me just go through each of your examples because they're perfect. So to begin with leaving the child. So I agree. And part of the power of that story is it's taking out from us that as, as you know, I hate to say this, but an easy option. So, so, so imagine like, 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 we have a family and we're just getting tired of the drudgery and we want to run away and think, oh, I'm doing it to you know, liberate my, myself and be compassionate to everyone around me. So the tradition builds in, by definition, no, you're running away. <laughs> so we are not being called upon to do what the Buddha did in that sense. Simply leaving our you know, child, for example, would, would it's difficult to imagine a scenario where that would actually be a good thing to be a compassionate human being. So it takes that out. And before I get to the larger point, let me go to your next examples because they, they each of them build upon the other beautifully. Even Gandhi, you're absolutely right. So was it an incredibly successful push against the British Empire? I mean, historically, yes, it, it, it worked in that literal sense. Um, nonetheless, I mean, had Gandhi not been assassinated and lived to see even a few more years, I, I, he certainly would not have said that everything worked out perfectly after that. And in fact, he lived to see the beginnings of how it was working out, and he was horrified. I mean, he was horrified about the growing religious wars. He was horrified both about how the British were exiting, but how the response was being done in India or South Asia broadly before the partition. Um, so absolutely, even he was seeing that, that it's just not going right, that we are not ready yet, that the discipline has not been sufficient. And you know, say, had he lived longer, he would have seen more of that. And then getting back to your key part, of the next part of the question, what about Gandhi himself? Can we go back and say he was perfect in every way? Uh, we can debate that, but, but according to the Buddhist tradition, by definition, he was not. <laughs> because by definition, he was still in the world of suffering, so of course he is still going to be falling into dangers. And since the Buddha is the figure we're holding up as the purely compassionate being, but we're not going to become the Buddha, <laughs> and anyone who thinks they're suddenly the Buddha is by definition not, then it creates exactly what you're getting at in your question, which is, yes, always you are being asked to rethink what you are doing, even when what you are doing seems to be good, you know, taking out the British Empire, <laughs> um, that every single thing you are doing, you are being asked to constantly ask, what is the suffering I am in fact creating, even when I think I am acting in a purely wonderfully good way? And so part of the power of the tradition is it kind of doesn't have an answer to your question because 
no one will be judging us. <laughs> or, or rather, I mean, like the world will be judging us because of the suffering we're creating, but they're also in the suffering. So there's no, there's not this omniscient being that will, will you know, give us a good heaven or good hell at the end based upon what that omniscient being sees we have done well or done not. The tradition would rather say, no, realize probably everything we're doing is creating suffering and we're hopefully just devoting our lives to being better and better and better at seeing that suffering, but a key part of that seeing that suffering is seeing the suffering we're continuing to create even when we think we're at our best. So part of the power of the tradition is it doesn't have an answer to that question, which I think is part of the sort of tension that makes the tradition so powerful. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to know more about um, how you would discuss, I guess, the relationship between gaining good karma or bad karma and intentionality. Because I feel like especially yes. in like the society that we live in now, yes. it's hard to imagine kind of doing or especially purchasing anything yes. that wouldn't end up I guess validating some kind of suffering, like for example, buying flowers for my mom that were yes. in Duke, like that were harvested by people with like illegal wages, like wages that are like too low, or like um, I don't know, like buying almond milk when like yes. the way that they produce it is inhumane in itself. Yes. Um, I guess like since out of like the six possible paths of rebirth, the only like cycle in which you can generate karma is um, when you are a human. Like, could you talk a little bit more about the way yes. that consciousness and intentionality affects your karmic Definitely. So yes, wonderful question. And the answer is intention plays a crucial role, but with a, a <laughs> key twist that's very important for the tradition. But to begin before I get to the twist, so intention's crucial in the sense that were I to, you know, to give an extreme example, you know, knowingly kill a human being out of intention, that's about as bad as it gets. If I walk on an ant and kill the ant, I've equally killed a living being, but I'm just walking. And so it was not intentional that I killed the ant. So yes, that has less karmic implications than knowingly and intentionally killing a human being, but Here's the little twist, and your, your examples raise it perfectly. Um, even the things that we might think, and I'll just stick with the examples which are beautiful, oh, I'm buying almond milk, so, so I'm breaking the, the dairy industry, so that's fine, or I'm buying flowers for my mother, and that's just a nice act. Um, as you said, this is still part of a world of suffering that we are actively supporting, and we can claim, oh, but it's not intentional, but this isn't like just walking on an ant, which by the way is still bad, but, 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 but the difference there is like the ant may literally be enough under the surface where I literally could not have seen the ant. And I can't literally you know, dig across the, the mud as I, as I walk all the time. So that's you know, obviously less significant. Your examples, which are wonderful, is the, the more along the lines of Siddhartha um, when he's being taken out on that procession and looking away, instead says, just look away, look away, look away, don't, don't see it, don't see it. And that's kind of more what we're doing. And in the Buddhist tradition, that's intentional. I mean, we're still responsible. We're still responsible for not seeing the world that is around us, because when we're not seeing the world that we are actively a part of, of creating and maintaining, it's the equivalent of, I don't see the suffering, I don't see the suffering. And that's intentional. <laughs> so yes, part of the training that we're doing is we're training ourselves to see that suffering. Um, and then of course the next part, which is equally difficult, is how do you break it? Like <laughs> simply not buying almond milk isn't gonna make the world better, <laughs> but how do you break it? And that's part of the power of the tradition too. It doesn't give you an easy answer. Again, there's no easy ism like, like well, here's our, our final political economic theory that will make everything perfect. No, you're training yourself in every situation, every world you're born into that we're part of maintaining, how to begin to shift that. And part of the power is, again, it won't give you an easy answer. But again, I think that's, <laughs> that really is part of the power. So great, thank you, wonderful question. For the, yes, please. Please, please. Amplify. Yes. So in previous lectures, uh, especially, you know, like Professor, right, Roberto? <laughs> <laughs> Me, Professor, <laughs> Professor Unger, has been talking about uh, how we negate the world as we are vulnerable to it mm. and participate in it. There's something unresolvable about that, as I take it. And 
And I, I hear that uh, kind of dynamic equilibrium of work here yep. in the Buddhist worldview where, you know, like a monk or a practitioner is uh, negating the world by seeing through its illusory nature, but also vulnerable to it in, in one's compassion and desire to serve the world and liberate yeah. sentient beings, etc. So the, I think the question yeah. is, uh, what are the similarities of yes. Buddhist engagement as opposed to Christian engagement? Because they both seem involved in that same tension. Maybe that dial, maybe that polarity is inescapable. Yeah, no, beautifully asked. And actually, you're correct. It's already become a key theme and will continue to be a key theme. So let me do exactly as you're doing, which is to generalize that theme. And I would say that is one of the key things that will join all of these axial age movements as well as the later sort of salvationist religions rereading of those and part of why we're turning to them in this course they're all in different ways partaking of that tension and i'll just use your language which i think captures it perfectly they're all calling on us to see the world that we are currently living in as not being just the way things are not seeing who we think we are as just being this is just me all of them are doing things that will force us, if they're successful, to realize that no, the world we are living in, all the hierarchies we take for granted, all of our ways of being in the world that we take for granted, all of that must be questioned. As you called it, and I think it's, it captures it perfectly, that's the negation. Like, like you were being trained to see through this world and break from the assumptions undergirding this world. And all of them absolutely are committed to that next part of the tension, which is not, okay, run away from it, but how do you then try to change it? And I think you're exactly right. That's what sort of joins these movements. And then that raises the next part of your question. Um, part of the power for us, the difficult work for us, is to wrestle with the differences of how they wrestle with that tension. Um, what are the gains and losses? I, I hate that terminology, it sounds very utilitarian. What are, what are the powerful inspirational sides as well as the dangerous sides of the ways those tensions are being posited and the ways that articulations are being given to work around those tensions? And we've noted the powers and potential dangers the way it's happening in Christianity. I think we will see the exact same thing with Buddhism, and in a few weeks we will see this with Confucianism. And just to give you a preview, we are not going to say any of these, we're only looking at three, obviously we had we more time, we would discuss many more, but even of the three we'll be discussing in depth, certainly we would not be arguing any of these three has the final answer, but what we would say is they are all trying to wrestle with this tension in ways that, that worked in certain situations then, but we're in a very different world now, and how would we try to bring up a comparable tension, wrestle with it with every bit of the level of power and depth these early traditions were trying to do, but by definition it would mean we'd have to recast the t tensions in a different world, hopefully learning dramatically on what has happened before from these three traditions, but it would have to be changed, and how would we do so in a way that, again, getting back to the heart of your question, would maintain that tension because most of the domestications we've been talking about will continue to talk about. One of the reasons they're so dangerous is they end that tension. <laughs> that the domestications tend to sort of take these tensions and reduce them to something, not only that's trivial, but, but even more dangerously, means we kind of accept most of the world as it is and take one little piece from the tradition to help it a little bit, but that cuts out on the power of the tradition, which is all about getting us to question the entire framework and a set of assumptions we live with. So yeah, please follow up, please. Well, I, I love that connection because to me, um, it, it relates heresy to domestication, which is Fascinating. Kind of false finality. So I love that you two are coming at that from different angles. That's really uh, yeah. Yep, fascinating. And, 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 and there, and of course, the flip side too, which just underlines your point, oftentimes it's the orthodox sides that can be the domestications, which is why you see the heresies. It's the, 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 sometimes among the most exciting parts of these traditions. So yeah, I think that's beautifully put. Yeah, thank you. Beautifully put. Other thoughts? And yes, please. Oh, is that a... Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> but just to point out that Please. there are some Buddhist personalists who do believe in selves. Yes. There are Buddhists who have like every range of yes. epistemological and metaphysical 
does. Every range, yes. And any, any claim about, like, this is what Buddhists believe is going to be... Absolutely. And, and yes, and, and just to underline that point, it's important to note, even in the, the readings that we've given you, which are absurd, just in their, their, you know, <laughs> like, like, their smallness, um, but equally, it's important to remember this. Of every single statement, doctrine, that you find given in the Buddhist tradition, it operates in a different register than we often tend to think of doctrines as operating in. So often we think of the doctrine as, oh, this religion or this philosophy believes X, and that doctrine is X. In Buddhism, very much underlying the point, no, these are attempts to break certain notions of being. So to give an obvious example that does appear in the readings, when you get a statement that the world we see as permanent and stable is in fact absolute flux. Now, that's a common statement you'll find in lots of Buddhist claims. You might immediately think, so, but isn't that then making an ontological claim that the world is in fact inherent flux? Well, yes and no, by which I mean the goal of that statement is to break our viewing of the world as permanent and stable, which is part and parcel of how we come to see the world we're living in is just the way things are and unchangeable because we think it is literally unchangeable. That's just how the world is. Because we think that, we need to constantly be told that in fact the world is constant flux. But if you think, okay, but isn't that then making an ontological claim? Let me just give another example that also appears in the reading, since the, the power of the example, as you can see it being said, um, one very famous figure, Nagarjuna, will explicitly say, well, of course, nirvana is samsara, and samsara is nirvana. Like, you will realize, in other words, by definition, that any simple, oh, samsara is just the world of our everyday life. So any simple division of this world that we think is permanent, but it's illusory, and <laughs> the real world that's, in fact, illusory, I mean, that's, in fact, constant flux, no, samsara is nirvana and nirvana is samsara. That basic dualism is itself a dualism, and if you stick to that as a dualism, a stable, permanent dualism, you've fallen into it once again. Hence, the exact point that was raised correctly. So Michael, could you expound on the meaning of this proposition that samsara is nirvana? Yes, yes. So the meaning of that would be, lest we think, um, and again, it goes back to the easy way out this tradition might be offering us, and it's and endless attempts are not to give us those easy way outs. An easy way out would be to think, okay, well, if I can break from the world of samsara, you know, the, which, in other words, the world of suffering created um, through our actions to try to see the world as permanent and stable based upon stable selves, if I can break from that world of samsara, I achieve nirvana, which is pure emptiness. And the danger of the power of that statement is all the reasons we were giving. The danger of that statement is it sounds like, okay, well then just break from this world of suffering and then you've got perfection of some kind. And the ultimate teaching has to be, no, by definition that's not the case because by definition that is trying to give yet another stable category. And any time we have a stable category that we then act upon, it will allow us to do easy way out. And that, just to reiterate a few examples we've given, an easy way out is think, well, you know, anything I can do to escape from this world of suffering is you know, better because I'm creating less suffering. And the tradition is committed to saying, no, every such attempt is probably going to be much worse. And the grander metaphysical way of saying that would be to say, even if I work out a grand complicated metaphysics of what this world is and what an ultimate reality is, by definition, I am a human being working this out. I probably am doing so for reasons that I don't understand in terms of my own <laughs> false understandings, one of which would be a claim that there are these two dualistic things of samsara and nirvana. So by definition, I have to admit that my division is doomed, but much more importantly, in my actions, I cannot rely on an easy way of reading those, and any permanent, stable dualism, by definition, gives you those easy way outs. And hence, the tradition has to work against it, and hence, the tradition will also endlessly give you these seemingly contradictory doctrines, which again, aren't doctrines the way we used to often use the term, they're doctrines to push us against current assumptions we are making. So, 
the Buddha will say different things to different disciples because different disciples have different ways of building dangerous worlds and they need to be broken in different ways. And then the whole tradition plays out that way. So Michael, what I propose to do now is to suggest an account that is complementary to yours. Yes. You've uh, focused on the uh, personal experience of the Buddha and the ethical vision that results. And I'd like to go in the opposite direction from the metaphysical to the moral. Mm -hmm. So in an earlier class, we distinguished two dominant traditions in the history of philosophy. The world history of philosophy, the tradition that I call the philosophy of deep structure, the Greek philosophy of being. Remember that central idea there is that there is a, an ultimate structure of the world, its basic components, and a framework of regularities governing this structure, the laws, constants, and symmetries of nature as they are described in modern Western science. And uh, this is the object of reason. Uh, it is the ultimate truth of the world, the structure, these regularities and these components. And they are outside of time. So time is real, but it's not completely real because the thing that is most real is beyond time, immutable, according to this theory. Now, the other major tradition in the world history of philosophy uh, I labeled in an earlier class the philosophy of the timeless one, sometimes also called speculative monism. Uh, it had representatives in Western philosophy. We'll be dealing with the most important of them next week, Schopenhauer. Uh, but it was dominant in the philosophy of ancient India. And this view says that uh, the ultimate reality of the world is one thing, a unified substance, a reality, which is also timeless. All the distinctions, including the distinctions among selves, and the changes that fill our experience are in some sense illusory. That's the philosophy of the timeless one. And the philosophy of the timeless one was then developed as the metaphysical background to this Buddhist view. Even though the metaphysical development was in some sense subsequent to the formulation of the moral ideas. So central vision of Buddhism is stated by the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. The source of suffering is craving, insatiable desire. Suffering can have an end, and there is a path by which we can bring it to an end, which is then the description of the moral process of, of Buddhism. Uh, this is the radical version of the philosophy of the timeless one. And although it appears to be fundamentally uh, opposite to the philosophy of deep structure, it is united to the philosophy of deep structure by a common assumption. And the common assumption is that what is most real is what is least temporal. So this unified substance beyond the apparent changes and uh, distinctions of the world that we experience is what is most real according to the philosophy of the timeless one. Uh, and that then suggested to us the idea of a third position, which I at that time labeled temporal naturalism, which is that everything that exists in the world is ephemeral, but no less real on that account. And the crucial move in the development of temporal naturalism is the dissociation of reality from timelessness, not making our idea of what is real depend on some limitation to the rule of time. Now, it, now this, this idea of the timeless one and the speculative monism exists also in the history of philosophy in qualified as well as in radical forms. The qualified form is the form that says 
the distinctions among things and the changes of things are not completely illusory. There is a hierarchy of reality. And behind the phenomena, the epiphenomena, the surface, lie the archetypes of reality. Plato's doctrine of forms, the middle Plato, the, the middle dialogues of Plato, is the most famous example of this qualified form of the philosophy of the timeless one. What is interesting is that the qualified form is the form that can be most easily married to a characteristic formula of the so-called Indo-European cultures. You call them the Bronze Age cultures. And the formula was this, this idea that there is a hierarchy in the soul that corresponds to the hierarchy in society. The hierarchy in society is a distinction among three large groups or classes or castes. The, the, the thinkers and priests who attend to the ultimate reality of the world, the fighters and warriors, and then the workers and peasants. And the social hierarchy is according to this formula, this Indo-European formula, as I'm calling it, associated with a hierarchy in the soul. There are the rational faculties, the faculties of understanding, the action-oriented impulses like courage, and then the sensual appetites. And that hierarchy in the soul is supposed to correspond one-to-one -to, -one to this social hierarchy that I described before. Each of, the each of these two hierarchies sustains the other. So the speculative monism then was an intellectual instrument for the subversion of this Indo-European formula. Whereas the qualified form of it, which existed before and had a later life as in Plato and some of the Neoplatonists, was actually capable of being reconciled with that formula. Now I want to say something about the metaphysic, as a metaphysic, as a description of what the world is really like and its, and its problems. So uh, the first problem is that it, it associates as if it were an automatic association transience with unreality. It doesn't follow from something being mutable or transient that it is unreal. Uh, there's no necessary association between the ephemeral character of something and its unreality. Now, there is a domain of our understanding of the world in which we affirm this clearly. It used to be called natural history. So if you ask, what are the characteristics of our natural historical insight into the world? By contrast to the assumptions of the philosophy of deep structure and its continuation in fundamental physics, the first is that there is no permanent repertoire of natural kinds, of kinds of things. The kinds of things are, for example, the species in Darwinian theory, or even before life, the different kinds of things in the, in the geological record, in planetary science. So the assumption in natural history is that there is no permanent list of the kinds of things that exist in the world. Like we're inclined to imagine that the particle structure described by the standard model of particle physics, or even the periodic table describe permanent things, even though we should know that given that the universe has a history, these things are also not permanent, and they once did not exist. So the second assumption is that the evolution of these things, their history, is driven by many loosely connected causal sequences. It's not like there's a system of laws or constants which was predetermined from the outset. There's a loosely connected set of causal transformations. 
And this is also what we think in natural history. So uh, why is it, for example, that mammalian evolution goes through the placenta line rather than the marsupial line? It's because of the relatively accidental feature of plate tectonics the movement of the continents on the surface of the planet. The marsupials were isolated in a relatively distant part of the world, uh, separated from the rest, and then the main line became, well, that's all of natural history, is like that. The third characteristic of this natural historical uh, reality, this way of understanding the world, is that we think that there are regularities that develop together with these transient phenomena. It's just a philosophical conceit, a metaphysical dogma, that the regularities existed before. Did the laws of Darwinian evolution or of Mendelian genetics predate the emergence of life? Well, that's, there's no reason to think that. The, the, the emergence of the laws is coeval with the emergence of the phenomena. You were going to say something. other physical system is not strictly determined? Like, where does the indeterminacy that you address? Well, I'm not, well, for the moment, I'm not speaking specifically about Buddhist metaphysics. I'm speaking about this larger philosophy of the timeless one. And I'm trying to begin to develop a questioning of it as an understanding of what the world is like. That is, and in this case, the idea that there is a uh, a structure which is atemporal, or that the reality is atemporal, is what is being questioned by this idea of natural history. So this is how we think of planetary science, or the, the, the life sciences, but it's not how we think of the basic structure of the world. Uh, well, why don't we think of the basic structure of the world that way? Because, as I said before, if the universe has a history, everything is like that. And rather than thinking of natural history as an exception to, to the world as presented by fundamental physics, we could say fundamental physics is a kind of provisional exception. We disregard the hi historical character of the universe and act and talk as if it were unhistorical, but actually we would have reason to do the opposite. That's the direction in which I'm going. Now, uh, there's a circularity in this philosophy of the timeless one. How could we demonstrate that it was false or know that it was true if we can have no causal engagement with the world? So causality presupposes time. There has to be a before and an after. If we think of the world as a timeless grid or and distinctions and changes as timeless, we have no way to engage the world and therefore no way in which to understand it. So we have this framework which we assert dogmatically. We have no way to question it, to falsify it, to demonstrate its truth. And there's a final mystery in this philosophy of the timeless one, which is that it implies that the world appears to us, us living things driven by cravings, in a form which disguises its true reality. Well, why? No representative of this philosophy in the history of philosophy has ever had, I think, a satisfactory answer to this question. Why does, the world, why does the world disguise its reality in the way in which it appears in our experience? We, we need an explanation for that question. Now, against this background, this metaphysical background, to some extent generated retrospectively after the formulation of the ethical vision, there is then an ethic. And what is the essence of the ethic? If we now disregard these distinctions 
between the different versions of Buddhism that you describe, Michael. The focus of the ethic is on serenity and benevolence. That is, uh, we suffer, driven by craving, uh, and we're entangled in the coils of this illusory view of the world, full of distinctions and changes. How can we disengage ourselves from these coils and therefore hope to overcome suffering? And to the extent that we disengage ourselves from this illusory view of the world, we then are able to have this universal compassion to all living things, all, all human beings, uh, and that's to, to, to share this responsibility for their fate, which you, which you describe. Uh, and this seems to be the essence of this orientation to existence. Uh, so there is a very intimate, profound connection between the ethical proposition, the, uh, the orientation to the conduct of life, and the metaphysical view. The metaphysical views make sense of this ethical idea. So now I want to finish this statement my criticizing the ethical view. So before I criticize the, the metaphysical presuppositions, now I want to present a questioning of the ethical view. And now we have a complication, because remember the argument at the outset of the course about the cognitive gap. We have these great orientations to existence. We can argue for them or against them, but the arguments for them or against them are always inconclusive. One of the main ways or one of the main reasons for which they are incon inconclusive is that an argument against one ethical view is, almost, is always delivered from the standpoint of another ethical view. There's no neutral position. There's no position from the start. And that is certainly true of the ideas which I'm going to state next. They represent the judgment of this view from the standpoint of another view. But that doesn't mean that they're entirely without force, because there's, there's still the question of which of these arguments should we credit more. All of these views, after all, are in a sense self-fulfilling prophecies. They say, believe me. And by believing me, you'll help make the world more like what I say it is. And the self-fulfilling prophecies may fail because that may not happen. The world may not be more, become more like what they say it is by virtue of our acting on them. So reality, mysterious, enigmatic reality, fights back against our metaphysical and ethical projects. And that's why this inconvenient fact that we can argue against one of these views only from the perspective of another does not entirely empty them of force. So first, with respect to the ethic of serenity and benevolence, we go back to the contrast between altruism and love. Uh, I would say now, speaking from the standpoint of the other view, of another view, uh, this impersonal altruism, this impersonal compassion, is not what we really want. Uh, we, uh, we want to be loved. Uh, and the fundamental deficiency is imaginative insight into the particular other. So in the, in the narrative that you told about the life of the Buddha, there was a crucial moment which you described only in passing, in which the Buddha, being enlightened, having decided to, to leave, abandons not just his wife, but his son. Well, he leaves his son in order to engage in this perspective of enlightenment. Now, what are we going to say about that? Uh, 
So th this is imaginative insight and attachment to a particular human being, not to the whole world, to the cosmos, to all creatures. And this is what we want. So, th uh, and this rather cold, impersonal altruism is a rather poor substitute for this thing that we really desire. Huh? So that's the first problem. Now, the second problem is, who are, what are we really like? Uh, and, and this is now continuing my argument from the standpoint of the other view, from the opposing view. Uh, so in our experience as human beings, everything points beyond itself. Uh, and this is manifest to us in the life of desire and in the life of the imagination. So our desires are rather empty. They're mimetic. They're, they're formed, they're heavily formed, shaped by what other people desire. And they're projected. We desire something for the sake of something else. Uh, so a large part of the life of the desire consists in finding proxies for something else that we really want. So for example, Robinson Crusoe on his island accumulates things as an alternative to dependence on people. This is the, one of the obsessions of the early modern English novel, the accumulation of things. What's the point of the accumulation of things? It's to serve as a substitute for interdependence among people. Uh, and so we're surrounded by all these finite things, but we desire the infinite. We desire something that is unconditional and we make the finite things serve as substitutes for what we really desire. In our mental experience, we have these two sides of the mind. We have the mind as a machine, formulaic and modular, and we have the mind as an anti-machine. That's what we call the imagination. It combines everything with everything else. It discovers something that it doesn't yet know how to make sense of, and then retrospectively develops the methods and the criteria by which to make sense of it, that's the imagination. The imagination proceeds by negation. We distance ourselves from the phenomenon, and then we subsume it under a range of possible variations. That's how we understand things. So our, our life of desire and our life of imagination proceeds by this work of denial, of negation. Uh, that's how we engage the world. That's how we understand it. Uh, and uh, we must, in order to do this work, assume the reality of these particular things. Now, and these are not separate arguments, by the way. These are all different ways, in a sense, of formulating the same argument. Now we come to the third, this third consideration. So life. One of the most powerful elements of this philosophy, of this religion, and of Buddhism, is this suggestion that salvation is not in the future. Salvation is within our reach now. It's before us. If we orient ourselves in the right way and understand the, wor the world in the right way and practice the crucial discipline meditation, uh, altruistic devotion to others, and a detached vision of the world. Next week, we're going to see this in Schopenhauer. Supposedly, in art, we can have this disinterested vision of the world. So gaining control over consciousness, disinterested view of reality and holiness, this, which is this universal compassion. Uh, uh, and it's, there's this deep question now of what is the main object? What is it that especially uh, attracts us and that we revere? Uh, Life, vitality, and what are the attributes of life? 
First, surfeit over structure. Second, spontaneity. And third, surprise. The ability to create the new. That's vitality. And vitality, you might say, comes before goodness and comes before rightness. And salvation is to come into the possession of love. Now, I want to read here a passage from the poet Wordsworth uh, that is about this subject. Uh, and it comes from a pamphlet that he wrote during the Peninsular War, Napoleon's invasion of the Iberian Peninsula, attacking the English for their abandonment of the Spaniards and the Portuguese and their de facto complacence with Napoleon's invasion of the peninsula. And in the midst of this political pamphlet, Wordsworth says the following. But it is, it is a belief propagated in books and which passes currently among talking men as part of their familiar wisdom that the hearts of the many are constitutionally weak that they do languish and are slow to answer to the requisitions of things. I entreat those who were in this delusion to look behind them and about them for the evidence of experience. Now this, rightly understood, not only gives no support to any such belief, but proves that the truth is in direct opposition to it. The history of all ages tumult after tumult, wars foreign or civil, with short or with no breathing spaces, from generation to generation, wars, why and wherefore, yet with courage, with self-sacrifice, with enthusiasm. The visible and familiar occurrences of daily life in every town and village. These demonstrate incontestably that the passions of men, I mean the soul of sensibility in the heart of man, in all quarrels, in all contests, in all delights, and in all employments, which are either sought by men or thrust upon them, do immeasurably transcend their objects. The true sorrow of humanity consists in this, not that the mind of man fails, but that the course and demands of action and of life so rarely correspond with the dignity and intensity of human desire. And hence, that which is slow to language is too easily turned aside and abused. So that's an opposing view of what is ultimately at stake. It's life. And how are we to enhance it and to secure it? Uh, and what is the opposite to this? The opposite is to say that we will, we will deal with the troubles of life, as it were, and now I return to my incendiary statement from a few weeks ago, through, by a foretaste of death. That is, we'll die beforehand. We'll cast a spell on ourselves. We'll will serve others in personal altruism and benevolence. Uh, but rather than seeking to enhance this trouble, this intensity of life, uh, we'll cast a spell on ourselves of uh, serenity. We won't look for trouble. We'll try and stay out of trouble. And that's the opposite of what the poet is recommending here. Uh, trouble is our salvation. Uh, and not trouble in the sense of impersonal benevolence and altruism, universal compassion, the cold compassion, uh, but all the trouble that arises from being connected to people and being with the danger that we'll be rebuffed from them, uh, from assuming struggles in the world tasks with the danger that we'll pick the wrong side, we'll make a moral mistake, not just a practical mistake. Uh, and 
that's what we that's what we have to avoid if salvation is life and not serenity uh, now I want to make state the same idea in the final form in the final form and that's this in this philosophy it seems to me there is a contradiction between the theoretical antidote and the practical antidote to nihilism so what do I mean by nihilism? Nihilism is the sense that our lives and the world itself are meaningless. The theoretical antidote to nihilism is the view that the distinctions among selves and among uh, and the changes that exist in the world are all epiphenomenal. They're illusory. They are the source of craving, and we should transcend them by denying their reality, by getting away from them. That's the theoretical antidote to nihilism. The practical antidote to nihilism is our company of one another. It's, it's human connection. Uh, uh, and all our connections and engagements in the world. About this, the philosopher Hume, David Hume, says the following, and now I'd like to read this other text. It's a famous passage from Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding. Where am I, or what? From what causes do I derive my existence? And to what condition shall I return? I am confounded with all these questions and begin to fancy myself in the most deplorable condition imaginable, environed with the deepest darkness and utterly deprived of the use of every member and faculty. Most fortunately, it happens that since reason is incapable of dispelling these clouds, nature herself suffices to that purpose and cures me of this philosophical melancholy and delirium. Either by relaxing this bent of mind or by some avocation and lively impression of my senses, which obliterate all of these chimeras, I dine, I play a, ba a game of backgammon, I converse and am merry with my friends. And then, after three or four hours' amusement, I would return to these speculations. And when, after three or four hours of amusement, I would return to these speculations, they appear so cold and strained and ridiculous that I cannot find it in my heart to enter into any of them any farther. That's the practical antidote to nihilism. So the theoretical antidote to nihilism subverts the practical antidote to nihilism. That is, the theoretical antidote to nihilism is to say this is a world of, of, of this is a world of illusion. These distinctions, these changes. Uh, the practical antidote to nihilism. This is the real stuff, uh, and uh, this is what we should seek in order to have a response. To, to, to the philosophical delirium uh, and melancholy. Uh, so that then states the, the, the opposition to this view from a different perspective. Uh, and this is, of course, an argument that has no conclusion. And that's, <laughs> and that's the point of the argument, yes. <laughs> Let's open this up for conversation.
choosing correctly and being preoccupied with making the right choice, do, do you just have to accept that the unintended consequences of the mystical reality of the world just might lead to things that we originally never wanted to be a part of? Or how, how does one... So this is really a question about what I call the cognitive gap, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a question about the inconclusive character of our arguments. So uh, th there's no way out of this, right? But th that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these arguments are at the same level, that they're all equally persuasive. Uh, so I think they're not. So if we, if we look to our personal experience or we look to the history of the world, uh, I referred in an earlier class to this World Revolutionary Project, uh, and I, which has set the world on fire for 300 years. And uh, it has, I said, it has two sides. It has the political side, democracy, liberalism, socialism, and then the personalist side, romanticism and especially the worldwide popular romantic culture. And it's the opposite of all of this, right? Of the philosophy of the timeless one, of the impersonal altruism and benevolence. Uh, it doesn't believe in any of that. Uh, and it has, and now it remains the most powerful project in the world. Humanity has been persuaded by that, but it's now paradoxically weak as well as strong. It's weak because its adepts no longer know what its next step should be. So I see this course of ours as being about the next steps of this project on its personalist side. And there's another argument in other books and other projects about the next step on the political side. So to keep this world revolution going, we have to be able to reinvent it. In, with a new form, with a new content. And so that's taking a side. So, and, and now we're in this counter-revolutionary interlude in the, his, in, the, in the history of humanity. And I said, I don't want my ideas and my deeds to be shaped by the biases of the counter-revolutionary interlude. So, but this project has enemies. And frankly, one of its enemies is this one that we're discussing today. Uh, and and it, 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 it says, no, that's not the way to go. This is an illusion. So in, in the world history of philosophy, there are these two views of, of, of happiness. One view says, happiness is the privation of suffering. In the history of Western philosophy, Schopenhauer gives a, a dram the most complete argument in favor of that view. The other view says, uh, no, happiness is not the privation of suffering. Happiness is fullness of experience and agency, enhancement of agency. And that comes with contradiction, and contradiction brings suffering. So the first view leads to the prescription, stay out of trouble, which is compatible with altruistic devotion and compassion and so forth. The second view says, look for trouble. Uh, it's a completely different conception. Uh, and so uh, I don't think that those are, I, I'm not going to pretend that I think that those arguments are at the same side. And I think that humanity has made its choice. Uh, the, the, the majority of humanity in favor of the revolutionary project, in favor of romanticism, in favor of looking for trouble. Uh, so that's, the, 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 that's what I'm saying. So, uh, but that doesn't resolve this argument. treating, for whatever reason, emotional reasons or attachments or fear, 
those who don't end up choosing the path of life, the path of vitality? Should we see them as, I don't want to use that word, but, <laughs> but practically, Well, so this is a problem that comes from the discussion of <laughs> it comes of a problem that comes from the discussion of Christianity, yeah. right? Christ says, "Love the stranger," but we can't love the stranger. Huh? <laughs> then come the moral philosophers in the West. The moral philosophers offer us, instead of love, Christ's command, the uh, the cold comfort of a altruistic and impersonal benevolence. And now I'm not talking about Buddhism and so forth. I'm talking about Western philosophy, like Immanuel Kant. Uh, uh, that's what they offer us, and that's not good enough. So, what is the what is the alternative to love in life among strangers? Uh, uh, it's cooperation among free and equal individuals, and then there's a struggle in politics over. What will be the form of cooperation? What kind of market order? What kind of democratic politics and so forth? That's what fills history uh, and should feel, fill history. So there'll be this conflict. Huh? And the conflict is, is what is necessary. The conflict is not something to get over in, uh, on, this, on this view. Huh? Uh, but then there's a question, one of the forms of estrangement in modern society is, in, in these contemporary societies, is when they become free, they become cold. So in many societies in the past, in these hierarchical societies, the characteristic formula of social life was a combination of exchange, power, and allegiance or affect. So it was the sentimentalization of unequal exchange, repeated endlessly in every quadrant of social life, in the relations between bosses and underlings, between men and women, between parents and children, and so forth. Then come these market societies and democracies, and they decompose this formula into separate elements. There's. Uh, power in politics, a change in the market, and affect or allegiance in the family. What then happens is that as we become free, we become cold. And that then the, one of the suppressed topics in the evolution of social theory. So the question becomes, how can we be free and warm at the same time? I don't think that the warmth can come from an effusion of family life, which was the premise of this idea of the sentimentalization of equal. It has to come from another source. And I think the most probable source is imagination, that our political and economic institutions should become tangible embodiments of the imagination, creators of the new, huh, in which they create around themselves a periphery of new possibilities, and then this imaginative energy is the source of a different kind of warmth. Not warmth in the sense of a diluted form of love, of affect, but this raising of the energy level, which is another version of life. That's, I, think that, I think that the general tone of those ideas goes in a direction completely different from this direction of the impersonal altruism. Uh, it's a different idea. And my bet is that that idea will be much more attractive to humanity uh, than this diminishment of suffering. So we don't want to stay out of trouble. We want to look for trouble, we, we all, in this post-revolutionary world. And that's what we should do. We just have to find another way to do it.
Yes. Yes. Oh, actually, two minutes. Yes. Well, yes, yes. You you first. Time. First, you. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to try to stay within the personal misconception that we're trying to talk about in this class. Um, and a lot of what we talk about seems to be the way I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it. But it's Can you speak louder, please? Because you're Absolutely. way in the back. I'm usually asked to speak softer, so it's, it's a good thing. Um, so a lot of what we talk about in this class seems to be related to will and desire, right? The, the desire for vitality. But what and how would this philosophy deal with uh, ability, the limitations of ability? So let me take a concrete example. Um, uh, someone that has gone on for professional basketball for 20 years, professional soccer for 20 years, and their physical body at some point just cannot keep up anymore, and they are desiring to continue to play sports, right? But it, there's just a physical limitation. Yeah. So there is a, an absolute desire for vitality desire to continue to make the most out of it, but physically they are not uh, able anymore. How, as a like, from a philosophy of vitality, do we deal with that physical limitation? Well, you're, you're now, I don't know how I should answer, because the way you've described my position, it sounds as if I were Nietzsche. Uh, uh, <laughs> so it, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't my intention. Uh, so it's not some kind of worship of vitality. What I'm trying to describe a set of categories which goes in a different direction from the direction of an impersonal altruism and benevolence and serenity. That is, the object is not to become serene. Uh, and the object is not to overcome suffering as conflict and contradiction. That's not the object. The, it's this other object. Uh, in which we, so, uh, and, and another diagnosis of what our problem is, that we, uh, that we, we go through life half awake in these formulas, in these routines, and uh, so the thing that is precious, which is our, which is life, which is salvation, escapes us while we're living. Uh, so that's, that's then the enemy. We shouldn't want that. We should, we should want to die only once, not to die in installments and not to deal with the troubles of life by dying beforehand. So I think that puts us, our striving, in a different direction, uh, which is, which is not, not the direction of achieving composure in the face of death. We don't need composure. I mean, uh, Dante Alighieri puts in the first circle of hell there, uh, those who blew neither hot nor cold. Huh? Uh, they were indifferent. Uh, the punishment meted out to them by Dante is that they spend their lives chasing after empty banners. They're chasing after the banners. The banners don't say anything. They never <laughs> took sides. Uh, so that's not a that's not an answer to your to your problem of of our failing powers, our mortality, our physical decline. Uh, but it's a, a different idea of where our salvation lies. In struggle. Yes. How do you think causal determinism affects any of this philosophy? Causal determinism. So. Well, uh, so cause, So the question is whether it's true causal determinism, right? Uh, so, on the, so when you ask how, you mean how it would affect this if it were true? I suppose if you if you want to deny causal determinism and assert a libertarian freedom, that would be interesting as well. No, 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 no. But not. But, but not, now you're. So, I think. So the, the, the world is productive of novelty, right? And so we, and one way in which our idea of the possible is, um, is distorted is we think of the possible state of affairs as a predetermined horizon around us. So it's as if the possibles were like ghosts 
stalking the world. They were behind the curtain, and they're waiting for uh, their cues to come onto the stage of actuality. That's the deterministic idea of the possible, right? Uh, our, our image of the possible is, in fact, a rear view mirror projection of what has happened, of, 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 of novelty. So the question you raise is about this issue of the relation between history and structure. And this goes to the philosophy of deep structure. So uh, if you think that everything in the world is historical, history has priority over structure, not structure over history. Uh, and all the, all the structures described by the standard model of particle physics, periodic table and everything else, once did not exist. And then there's novelty. Novelty is permanent in the world. So, uh, and it's accelerated. So it precedes life. So, for example, the, the formation of crystals described by crystallography that preceded the emergence of life is a new structure that emerged in the world. Uh, then comes life. Life accelerates the creation of novelty. Then comes society and the human mind. It accelerates the creation of novelty. Then the development of things like the knowledge economy or democracy 